Season four of Notebook on Cities and Culture is brought to you by Daniel Murphy, Polar Inertia, a journal of nomadic and popular culture online at polarinertia.com, and by Press Up, friendly web consultants who listen to your goals and provide solutions that make sense. Online at pressupinc.com. I was talking last night to a writer you publish, uh, Sean McAuliffe. You were talking about, he's obsessed with Los Angeles as well as Toronto, and Los Angeles is where I live, and I feed my own obsession with the place by reading the writing of it. And I've noticed there's not a lot of great Los Angeles writing in the past 20 years, but I noticed that the best Toronto writing comes from the past 20 years, much of it published by your house. Tell me, what, what kind of a time is this for Toronto writing? A good time, I, I think. Uh, in the past, you know, the, the, the Canadians are, are prone to self-deprecation or a lack of enthusiasm uh, for, for our, ourselves. So uh, to take the... Uh, there have always been books about Toronto and about Canada, but in the past 20 years, we've finally started to embrace the possibility that we could mythologize our own city. Mm, what happened in the past 20 years that made that possible? Most specifically in the last 10 years, we had, uh, if I can trace it back to the to, the, to our governing um, or, or non-governing leaders, as sure. the case may be, um, uh, we had a terrible mayor in the 90s, uh, Mel Lastman, who um, embarrassed us internationally by saying he wouldn't go to Africa because he didn't want to be eaten by cannibals. Um, always a danger. <laughs> Poison darts, too. Yeah. Uh, and then he was ushered out of office, and we elected David Miller, who was a tremendous, progressive, interesting, uh, productive mayor. And there was a lot of controversy around it, and he generally brought really great things to the city. And then when he uh, decided not to run again, we ended up with Rob Ford, who I'm sure even in L.A., <laughs> Oh, especially, especially there, yes. But he's, a, he's an international celebrity. Well, lucky for us. <laughs> uh, and I think that that has caused us to think about ourselves and to imagine ourselves in an international context in a way that we haven't had to do before. So it encourages us to think a little more, uh, in a little more focused way about the place that we live. And it's here in the city of Toronto, the city that's now thinking about itself in a more focused way than ever. I'm coming to you today. On notebook, from which I'm coming to you today, excuse me, on Notebook on Cities and Culture, speaking right outside, well, right near the University of Toronto campus and right outside the facilities of Coach House Books. It's both office and printing press here. I'm speaking with the editorial director, Alana Wilcox. She's also a writer, and she's very close to the, literally you're close to the publication of books, the making of books. Why does Coach House have its printer, which we can maybe even hear on the recording? It's It's this sort of variety of machines right here on the premises. This uh, Next year is our 50th anniversary, if you can believe it. We can't believe it. Uh, and the publishing company actually emerged from the printing company. So the printing company has always been in the foreground of what we do here. So when you have the means of production, you might as well make it into something you can uh, make a business out of. So, uh, so that's why we continue to print here. I think it's absolutely imperative for cities to have these sort of multi, multi-usage multi neighborhoods. So we're right beside Robart's library, but we're a manufacturing plant, in, if you can call us that. We're very small. It's always been a thing at the Coach House that cultural producers should be should have access to the means of production for their work. So we don't just have we don't just print the author's books, we get them involved in choosing a typeface and cover design and those kinds of things. And part of that means coming, we also we always invite our authors to come and watch their books be glued. Mm. Uh, Do they ever say no? I can imagine everyone says yes, but... Sometimes they're like, why? I don't no, really I understand why you would want me to do that. You want me to do your work for you. Uh, <laughs> but then they come and they see it happening and they see the first copy of their book come off the gluing machine and suddenly be a book and this thing they've been working on for years is suddenly this tangible object. I love that that idea of 
keeping this place as kind of a museum of how print culture has worked over the past um, you have half generations decade. of machines too in there. Absolutely. Some used, some not. We have we have loose lead type, we have a linotype machine, and then we have our Heidelbergs. But we do all our work, of course, on state of the art, top of the line Max. So we've kind of covered the whole. My desk, in fact, is the. I think it's the first Unix server in Canada. Really? Uh, it's a my desk is a door on top of a filing cabinet and this huh. this server. So we've always been very involved in the in the huh. 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 in the technology of of printing huh. and of of art making. And the reminders are literally all around you. They really are. You can't you can't move around. It's a very cluttered building. I wish you could see it on the huh. podcast. They can maybe hear it a little bit. But tell me, when did when did Coach House when did their lineup become more focused on Toronto, or when did there start to become a sort of robust selection of Toron- directly Toronto-focused books in, in Coach House's uh, list. There's always been an emphasis on Toronto writers simply because we're here and because this place has always been a bit of a cultural hub. On any given day, there's bound to be some writer or sculptor or musician sitting at our coffee table uh, drinking bad coffee and eating cookies. <laughs> and so it's always we've always had a... a We've always been more inclined to publish Toronto authors. But then in 2005, Jason McBride, who was our managing editor at the time, and I were talking about David Miller, this legendary mayor, and decided that it was his election or his impending election was marking a time of of real change and a sense of possibility in our city that we hadn't seen before. And so we decided to collect an anthology of essays called Utopia with a capital T-O in the middle because that's how Toronto was referred to, Toronto, Ontario, T-O. So Utopia, Towards a New City. And we asked uh, as broadly as we could for people to write an essay imagining what would make Toronto better. We didn't want cranky um, criticism of Mel Lastman or you know what's gone wrong. We wanted people to, to actually use their imaginations and think forward. So, came what up would you have in Toronto? Not what would you not have? Exactly. So we came up with a system of you know cycling tubes. Um, you know, a, a Ferris wheel. I think was one of them. There, there were some were more pragmatic. Some were more pie in the sky. But it really. It really sparked something. The other publishers, I think, laughed at us a little bit for <laughs> for doing this because you simply didn't publish about Toronto because no one cared. Uh, it's an odd sentiment to have about a city that is the biggest city in a country and one that attracts so many people and you know so much ire as well. It's very interesting because you would think that we're kind of the New York of Canada where everyone might sort of disparage New York in some way in America, but at the same time acknowledge that it's sort of the center of what's happening. Here in Canada, people just hate Toronto. <laughs> you go anywhere else in the country and they, they don't even they don't even think twice about disparaging the city. I've so, not quite got to the bottom of that. I mean, what are they usually, what are the reasons they hate it? You know, there's, um, there's, there's a book in there that <laughs> <laughs> I don't really want to publish. <laughs> Uh, no, I mean, I've encountered politicians who say, oh, you're from Toronto, I'm so sorry. So they're from another province or something, these politicians? Yeah, uh, yeah. Yes. I mean, it's the same thing. Major, As you say, New York, major cities in America have this too, you know. I go to other parts of America and I'll say, where did you come from, Los Angeles? And the, oh, I'm sorry, is a, is a, is a response that I hear as well. Or just one guy in Seattle recently was like, did you, did you come here to breathe some real air? I was like thinking, well, the air is the same. I mean, the air is fine in Los Angeles. So maybe it was bad before I lived there. I don't know. But is there a sense that Toronto is also, people have old ideas about it or just sort of incorrect ones? Or does it even matter? Do they just kind of not want to like the thing that's the city that grew, you know, too big? You should have told Seattle you were bringing them sunshine. <laughs> yes. Uh, you know, I don't know because it, it, it inspires such ire in me that I, I never get the conversation much past the, the insult. Um but, you know, there was an element of that sort of self-hating, you know, anti-Toronto vibe here in the city. And part of the reason for doing the first Utopia book was to was to address that. So so we did it. We collected these essays and to the sneers of the other publishers uh, had a launch that filled um, a, a giant space in uh, on Queen Street. We I think we had 300 people there. Wow. Um, the book went on to sell a pretty astonishing number of copies for a book that was only about one city. And so we turned it into a series where we began to focus on other... Uh, so, so the first one was broadly about Toronto, and then we moved into the arts and the environment and 
uh, civic engagement, mm. food, water. What What did it tell you that there was more of a demand than you had perhaps expected for a book on Toronto? I mean, when you saw that this book was succeeding, what did you what did it make you realize? A few things. Um, first, that we've of course been selling ourselves short. Uh, second, that it's it was an inspiration to see a group of of younger writers and thinkers fight against what the what our own government has has told us about ourselves. Um, uh, it was really exciting. It's really terrific to catch uh, to catch a bit of enthusiasm. And seeing these own essays, these these essays, seeing the essays collected in your own book here, seeing them for yourself, reading through these ideas about what people wanted for Toronto, what what did what did what did you learn about how people see Toronto just going by what writers wanted to see in the future? That it was much broader than I had ever imagined. You know, we are we are currently in the middle of a mayoral election and Transit seems to be the most pressing concern, and, and I suspect it is. But I love that these essays talked about things like guerrilla gardening, that somehow if we could just make people plant flowers in places they aren't supposed to, it would bring some small element of joy to everyone in the city. Uh, it, it also reminded me, we've got a lot of sort of, I say the term affectionately, but... Um, Civic nerds. Civic nerds, yes. Uh, people who are who study the manhole covers and know what all the markings mean and uh, that kind of thing, and that there's this real affection and um, enthusiasm for for every part of the city, mm. and that's what that's what surprised me. Mm. So that became a force you found you could sort of harness is not just the civic nerdery, but the. Uh, the the sheer interest that people had been not expressing before, not necessarily concealing, but this was a force nobody was really tapping into, right? That's exactly it. Mm. I mean, there had been a series of books on things like Toronto street names or um, the kind of thing you might buy for your grandpa. Sure. <laughs> yes, lots of sepia photos inside. Exactly. You know, Toronto ghost stories or something <laughs> like that. But there wasn't much that addressed people who had really both fanciful and pragmatic thoughts about how our city works. Right. And of course, the books directly on Toronto are only a part of the list at Coach House. I mean, you say, as you say, you publish also Toronto writers. I mean, how far does the mandate go? Are you are you publishing writers from all across Canada? Or I guess, where, where are the limits? We have a pretty broad program. We publish about usually 18 titles a year. So they're not just from Toronto. We, we do publish mostly Canadians, but from across the country. In fact, this season... Uh, we have one Toronto author out of our eight books, no two, um, but it, it just happens to be a season where they're coming from the rest of the country or one from France. Mm. And there's a bit of a mandate here as well too, with fiction and poetry especially, as I understand it, push the boundaries a bit. You know, do you, do you consider it? To, do you consider it that to be boundary pushing? Yeah, I mean that's a great word for it. It's it's hard to find a a term that satisfies what we hope to accomplish with our list. Experimental gets thrown around as a way of talking about literature. It's very off-putting, not... Because it doesn't mean anything. That's part of it. It doesn't mean anything at all. <laughs> uh, avant-garde, similarly. Yeah. Um, I prefer the term adventurous. Mm, I see. Um, which also doesn't mean that much. But. True, but what's an example... I mean, it's better. It's better. It's more evocative. Like, what's an example of an adventurous book Coach House has put out recently that personally just happens to be the kind of thing you you really want to read the kind of book you really would have just wished you could find before coach house published it just according to your tastes what's your adventurous i guess well all of them so it's hard to narrow it down but um within the context of nonfiction, we just published a book about surveillance and the ways that surveillance uh, called the inspection house the way that surveillance is sort of has infiltrated every part of our lives. Uh, on the fiction end of things, we're actually publishing a translation this fall from from a, a Parisian uh, called The Sleepworker. That's it takes the story of Andy Warhol and John Jarno, but puts it in the in the present mm. and the, the their film Sleep. Mm-hmm. Anyway, it's a it's a bit racy and it's the strangest book you might mm. ever encounter, and I absolutely love it for that reason. Poetry, our most our most successful poetry book of which we've sold a rather staggering number of copies. Uh, we published in 2001 called Unoya, 
and each each chapter of of the of the poetry book uses only one vowel. So in chapter A, you could use the word banana, but not the word apple. And it actually makes sense and tells the story. It's yeah, I'm familiar a bit with that work, uh, and I've followed the uh, I've seen the author of it speak occasionally. Uh, how do you pronounce that guy's name, by the way? Book. Okay. Christian, Christian book. book. Yes. It's that's, his real name. <laughs> umlaut over the O. So yeah. I was never 100 percent sure, but it's the, that is it's a fascinating work, and I think people who even don't know. Coach House Press will know that will will have heard of that perhaps if they're you know literary type people. Now thinking over the history of of Coach House and reading over it, it seems like there have been a number of distinct stages in Coach House's life. You know, there's they start it starts as a printer, it becomes as well a publisher, and there's sort of a change in the relationship to the printed book. There was like a kind of a disavowal there for a while of the printed book, and then a return to it as the main thing. What what is the what is Coach House's history relationship with with the printed book? It's a very long story that would probably fill an entire podcast. Sure, I guess in somewhat of a nutshell, I don't know. Uh, Coach House Press uh, existed until. 1996. Um, it was started here in this very building where you can hear the printing presses and sort of grew until it didn't quite fit in the building anymore and the, the editorial board took it from Stan who started the company, Stan Bevington, and um, and then things didn't work out so well so it closed in 96 and then Stan who started it in 65 restarted it in 97. It kind of had to start over again but with the same in the same place and with the same people and some of the same authors so so it is a bit of a bumpy history like many publishing companies but um, we're in a pretty good place now what at what stage of this did you come on board where did you come in in terms of coach house's history I've been here for 14 years mm. almost 15 so a long mm. long time so I not guess. long after that restart in the 90s yeah I think I started in 2000 mm -hmm. how was it how, how much was coach house on your radar before you came to work here Oh, mine. I was very involved in the literary community, so I was uh, very, very well aware of, of Coach House. I went to the University of Toronto and was involved in literary journals that printed here. But also, as a reader, I knew it was the place that published the books I wanted to read. I see. How, how far back does your involvement in the Toronto literary world go? Um, I guess the early 90s. Uh, used to go to... There wasn't much happening at that point. You know, there were a few reading series, but it wasn't the kind of... You know, now there's there's five events a night. You can't keep track. There's mm -hmm. different groups of um, different groups of writers. It's, it's really em emerged into something quite spectacular. It's interesting because Toronto was clearly already a big city in the early '90s, but somehow the literary world hadn't caught up to that size and suddenly did. I mean, was that is that how it feels like it happened? You know, it's possible there was more stuff happening earlier than that, and I wasn't around for it. But but certainly in the early '90s, there were there were two reading series that I knew of. Um, yeah, I think it was a different kind of energy. And you know, you mentioned the the sort of emergence of Toronto literature in the last 20 years. I think it it, it did all start to come together in the '90s. Mm. And how much of an interest? How long have you personally had an interest in sort of what Toronto is? I mean, people. There are some people who've lived here a long time who it doesn't really occur to them to to look. It's you know the fish and water thing, I guess. So how how long have you not just lived here, but found that it was an interesting place uh, in and of itself? Well, I think in about the mid '90s and the the, the Mel Lastman debacle yes. um, <laughs> around the time of the, the cannibal. Sure. Quote. Uh, I, I started to it's a really. Moment of reflection. <laughs> it's, it's a terrible moment where you think, someone. You walk down the street and you think someone elected this boob. <laughs> yes. Well, the people have been having similar thoughts recently. I hear in Toronto. So. Oh, one or two. Yeah. 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 Uh, but I think I sort of gradually became realized that I was allowed to have access to to that. I think there's a certain a certain vibe sometimes where you feel like maybe politics is something that you're not allowed to participate in. And as I gradually realized that that I was allowed to, and in fact, maybe was encouraged to, I became more and more interested. And then when we were watching David Miller starting to uh, emerge as a, as a possible factor, um, I said, that's right, this is, this is a thing. You could, so, you could see things going in a better direction then already? Yeah, it was, it was, 
I mean, he could string a sentence together. Yeah, sure, that's something. <laughs> Wasn't an overt racist. You know, it was, it was a great first step. <laughs> sure, sure, sure. In, in the same way, Obama, I think, did. You know, mm-hmm. and, and of course, these people end up being disappointments all the time. But there's that initial enthusiasm that something can change because we think things can't change. Back to the the stuff sitting right behind us. I mean, what are what are the advantages of of having the machinery right here on the premises where the office is? There's some pragmatic advantages in that, you know, we can print fewer copies of our books on a first print run because it only takes a week to get more of them. So if something starts to sell, we can, I just yell downstairs, John, we need more copies. And he, you know, we'll get it back on the press. Uh, So it's, it's less risky. Uh, We have some control over what happens. So for example, I did a book of poetry this spring that really wanted to have a hot pink cover with with silver ink on it sure. and and I can do that and I can mm-hmm. come downstairs and say no I think the silver ink needs a bit more white in it mm-hmm. or, uh, so we have some control that most yeah. publishers don't get to have every decision can be made right here absolutely we decide the print runs the day we're going to press mm-hmm. um, the other advantage is that we're able to showcase the book as a physical object. We do tours for schools um, usually once or twice a week. Our class, usually high school class or university class, will come in and we show them how how books get made. And it's amazing because they've grown up, of course, in you know an internet age sure. and are don't really understand books as objects. And so to watch them go through the process and they come in with you know cynical teenager face and uh, and then they watch this happen you can see them one by one the the, skin, the cynicism sort of starts to lift what's the step that usually gets them i mean what's when are they won over typically it's different it's different with every kid and you can kind of watch them the little light bulb uh, with each of them individually but they then they sit at the table upstairs and we talk to them and they they look at this book on the on the table and they they acknowledge that a person wrote it and that these people made it and it just becomes something that's that's more real you know i think the way that we don't know what where our food comes from or we don't pay attention to who made our clothes this is something that makes it more makes it more real you can be more conscious about it it's it is interesting this issue of the printed book because it's another one of these cases where we we got new technologies to read things. You know, we can read things on our computer. We could read on our computers and then on various handheld devices, our phones, our Kindles, what have you. And for a while there, the question was, is this the displacement of the book? Is this the next book? And then we realized, oh, this is... Now we just have more ways to read things. They all become specialized. Like, when MP3s became popular, I doubt anybody could have foreseen that vinyl records would go up in sales later you know it's like it becomes a differentiation i mean when did you ever have that moment where you thought the world might convert to non-physical books and then realized oh i guess this is just now we just now have a bunch of ways to read and we have to make a choice i never i never worried that the book was going away i think that we process information differently when we read it on the screen and i think ultimately a lot of people find it dissatisfying to read Electronically, I certainly do. I read, uh, you know, I read submissions and things on the iPad. But for my own pleasure reading, I like, I like paper books. So it's another advantage to having our presses here because we use, you know, we use paper that we have specially milled for us, and it's it's like a textured paper. So we're like the vinyl of books. Yes, indeed. It's, you know, what's what's the equivalent of 180 gram vinyl for books? I mean, is there like a really good paper you sometimes bust our, out? Our paper for every book, though. Yeah, most books. Some of them we don't, but yeah, it's a, it's a thick beautiful creamy yeah. zephyr with lay it's got the lines on it oh, nice I see. do you touch it you know <laughs> you describe this and it makes me realize we kind of forget that 20 years ago even 15 10 years ago because people what people read were books by definition or by default there were a lot of books that didn't have a lot of care put into the making of them like we had a lot of just crappy crappily made books and those seem to be are those going away is, is the world of the sort of I feel like every fall apart paperback I see is pretty old at this point and they're not going to last much longer. Are we, can we say we're done as a culture with uh, just the cheap, lousy printed books? It's interesting to me that the probably the most successful publisher in the, in the world of ebooks is Harlequin. Mm-hmm. 
And I think that's yeah. this is exactly <laughs> what you're... newspaper books, you know? You know, kind of like toilet paper, yes, exactly. you know, quality paper books. Uh, right. So, yeah, well, it's so quite no, pos- Nobody wants to be seen with the cover on the subway of a Harlequin book. Exactly. <laughs> as, exactly. As richly painted as they may be. We have the opposite problem because we offer, if, if people buy a print copy of one of our books, we give them the, uh, if they ask for it, we give them the digital edition right. for free. Mm-hmm. And so we actually have people who buy our books but ask for the ebook because they don't want to sully the print copy. They want to put oh, it on their shelf and not get fingerprints on it. They don't want to yes. spill coffee on it. Collector's item. Exactly, collector's right. item. So I feel like we've nicely transcended that right. that problem. <laughs> Are there books you deliberately make few of to for the sort of collector's item sense? Like you want a book to be as special as it can be and you might say this book we're only doing a few hundred copies and then we're going to call it quits just because this one is this is a limited edition or is every book potentially one you could just keep cranking out having the presses here means every book is one we can keep cranking out and you know our our love for the you know sort of fetish object of the yes. book is maybe surpassed by our love for the actual content of the book. Yeah, so yeah. so uh, it would break my heart to tell an author that only 300 people were allowed to read their book. Right. What if an author said that? Like, I only want this number of copies to release no more into the world. Is that a viable proposition for you? No. <laughs> I, <see>. I <laughs> understand why not. And it's never happened. Yes. <laughs> I mean, there are there are micro presses and chapbook right. presses if that's the kind of thing that you want to do. But You haven't had an author that eccentric yet. No, and once they understand how royalties work, they yeah, want the more so. copies oh, out there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Speaking of the amount of books out there to buy, and I was talking to somebody here recently who comes from Toronto. He was back to visit his family. He was he came back to find that his favorite bookstore on Bloor, I believe, had shut down. Uh, it was a branch of a chain he liked, I guess, but it was a local chain. Um, and I then said to him, that's funny because I see more bookstores here just walking around than I do in most cities that I go to. It's Does it strike you as a still a pretty bookstore rich town Toronto or does it to you seem like that does it seem like there are many fewer than there once were I only see the losses I mean we had a stretch of a couple of months last year where we lost about six stores Mm. Um, no I I, I see the losses it's been and I feel like we're a little behind um, America in that you know Mm. there's been a bit of a resurgence of the independent bookstore after borders uh, closed our chapter's Indigo chain is still uh, pretty forceful, and they, oh, they, they shut down quite a few independent bookstores. So um, that hasn't, they're still there. It hasn't, the indies haven't really rebounded yet. Right. I see. That's interesting because, yeah, Borders, Barnes & Noble, I never even liked going to those in their heyday because it's like you go there to find a specific book, and if they don't have it, okay, well, you wasted some time. Now, they, you know, there's Amazon for finding some sort of super specific thing, and there's independent bookstores for having the experience of going to a bookstore for seeing what you do find there i mean but here how many must have must there have been at the peak like i feel like there's a lot when i walk or maybe it's the areas i'm in but i just like huh, another bookstore that's that's interesting like what when bookstores were at their at the top of their game in toronto was there just one every block or what there were more i feel like now you there's probably a bookstore within a 15 or 20 minute bike ride of where you are but only downtown there's nothing in the suburbs and um you know it used to be maybe every within a seven minute bike ride i mean the the stores that were uh, um, book city the store your friend was talking about uh certainly a loss i worked there uh and pages on used to be on queen street was was more than a bookstore Mm -hmm. it was really a community center you would go there on a friday night to because you know you would run into your friends and everyone would be Shopping the small press table, or yes, the... yes, yes. I mean, what's is there any pattern to what's survived and what's not survived in the bookstores here, or is it just sort of random? Uh, geography, gentrification. Mm. Um, now, is that a good or a bad thing for bookstores? Gentrification is are the bookstores where the gentrification is, or are they where it's not? Yes and no. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's a complicated issue. Yeah, it is because something like Pages was a was a slightly grittier store. I mean, they had a counterculture table and a small press table, and they were on Queen Street, which used to be the uh, you know the kind of gritty bars and bands kind of kind of street. Every you know, also all the goths would hang out. This is in the 90s. Right, sure, um, when there were more goths. Yeah, 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 I don't think there are any more, but uh, now, now there's a store on Queen that's further west that opened maybe 10 years ago, Type, which is a terrific store, extremely well curated, beautiful, and smart about 
appealing to the gentrified neighborhood that they exist in. So they have a lot of like kids storytelling hours oh, and um, you know fancy coffee table books and that sort of right. thing. So it's not it's not the same vibe, but mm. they're they both fill particular needs. And I wish we just had both of them still. <laughs> right. Now with this process of both Toronto becoming conscious of itself, Toronto readers and writers focusing more on Toronto. Tell me, as this went on, in, in sort of your own personal narrative of that, what are some writers or books you were reading either years ago or recently that made you, that sort of galvanized your own interest, your fascination, interest in fascination with Toronto? Uh, one of the books that we published that I will always love profoundly is a book by Maggie Helwig called Girls Fall Down, and it was actually chosen as the one book Toronto should read oh, yes. uh, in 2012. And it just takes this look at the city. It's it's set. Um, one of the characters is a photographer who's going blind, and he is trying to photograph every every part of the city to somehow capture it before he loses his eyesight. So you sort of follow through his diminishing eyes. But at the same time, uh, there's a character whose brother is schizophrenic and has gone missing, sort of in the ravine system. So it's this piece of Toronto that you know I don't spend any time in the because we have this you know river right in the middle of the city right. that has this crazy ravine system and um, it just gave me a, a, a glimpse of a part of the city that I'm not accustomed to spending time in and the warmth and affection but also criticism of uh, of the city were really moving for me mm. with uh, with that one book program I mean, for those who haven't heard of it and I only heard of it when I got here what 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 is that program the public library chooses one title a year that they encourage every every person in the city to read. Of course, right. I think they There's a lot of people here. <laughs> they don't quite hit that mark, <laughs> but um, but even at a you know if, even if it's a five percent success rate, that's a lot of a lot of people reading the same book. And then they organize a ton of events uh, to to encourage people to talk about the book. They get the author out. They get they have panel discussions, related conversations, that sort of thing. So. Um, it's, I think it's a really interesting idea. Is it always a Toronto-centric book? No, but usually. I see. Because there's more of those these days. I mean, it's. do you see that across publishers, that there's more sort of Toronto-focused books? How much attention do you pay to what other publishers are putting out when you're deciding what Coach House needs to be putting out? I mean, is it a sense of, we need to be different? Or is it a sense of, I see this current, maybe we should have our own version of that current, right? Yeah, all of it. I mean, I, of course, pay attention to what everybody else is doing, but I also don't want to tread on their toes. We're all very collegial and, um, you know, there's not enough room for each of us to be doing the same thing. So, yeah, in terms of the, the Toronto books, it's more when something, you know, we get pitched a lot of books and it's just sort of what resonates well with us and with our mandate and what might fit into what we're what we're working on. Um we're doing a book in the spring. We don't normally do historical looks at Toronto, but we're doing a book called The Ward, which um, I don't know if you've been around City Hall. There's a there's a whole it's a whole neighborhood around what's called New City Hall, although it's from the 50s. Um, that used to be that used to be Toronto's original slum neighborhood. When any immigrant population wave came through the city. The Irish, the Italians, the uh, you know the Caribbean population—they all started the Jewish population. They all started in the ward, mm. and then moved out into other neighborhoods as they gained a foothold and got better jobs. But it's 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 staggering to see these photos from even the 20s and 30s of like absolute derelict slum housing and you know barefoot kids running around. It's yeah, it's. Yeah, like <laughs> Try to imagine. Right, right where our city hall is. Right. <laughs> so it's a fascinating book because it's it's uh, taking you know fifty different people's perspectives on this this area and this time period. How much of deciding what Coach House publishes uh, he not hinges on, but how much how, how important is it that it's a book you personally would would pick up off the shelf and read, or you would want to have on your shelf at home? You know, can you how much can you use your own personal would I buy this test as a, as a guide for Coach House? That's the hardest thing about being an editor and publisher is that you have to trust your own taste because that's why you're doing what you're doing. But at the same time, of course, there's crippling doubt sometimes. <laughs> you think, well, just because I like it, will anyone else like it? Um, so I factor, try to mitigate my own taste with some sense of uh, what other people here are interested in or what uh, what has 
how people have responded to our books in the past. Um, but yeah, ultimately, I don't want to work on a book that I don't like. Right, of course, of course not. <laughs> it's a lot of hours. It's a lot of a lot of time and energy. So. Speaking of the hours it takes, I mean, I mentioned before you're also a writer. You had a novel, A Grammar of Endings, in 2000. And I've heard you've been working on another one, but I can imagine that gets slowed down quite a bit by Coach House and the work involved here. Oh, I, t I entirely gave up. Oh, really? Really? <laughs> uh, this, this is the kind of job where you work... You work a lot of hours, you yes. know, it's kind of a seven day a week um, thing and there are events, there's usually two to three events in the evenings every week that I need to go to, a lot of travel. No, I I, I, I just gave up. <laughs> it's hard to be an editor and a writer too because you're, my job is to be um, the voice of criticism and when you turn that on yourself hard to get anything done. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's almost too much of a gear shift. You have to spend all day being objective about someone else's book and then trying to be trying to flip it around to a book you're writing yourself is it's got to be impossible. But tell me what what do you think it gave you to have written that first novel to, uh, now as an editor that you have that experience uh, behind you? I understand what it feels like to be on the other side of the table. I think that as a publisher it's easy to get impatient or um, you know frustrated with with the author and you know because sometimes they have very unrealistic expectations or you know they think that the book is going to change their lives or, or whatever um, it gives me a little more compassion I think which makes it of course harder to write the <laughs> 900 rejection letters I have to write every year <laughs> yes. but um, I don't know. I think it's just a sense. I, I'm, I'm happy to have come to publishing having done a variety of things. I was a bookseller, I've been a freelance editor, and and have been a writer. So I understand all the pieces. I guess what the question is: What part have you not done of publishing? Is there is there a distinct part you're like, you know, I've never worked as that? The great thing about a smaller house, I mean, there are four of us in the publishing end of this business, um, is that you there's not really any part that I haven't done. Mm. Except agenting, I guess. But um, that's a there's... dark art. Agenting, I don't, <laughs> I know. agenting. I don't know how it works. I don't want to do it. <laughs> uh, no, I like the fact that I can, you know, I schlep boxes and I pack things and do accounting and, you know, I, I, I get to do all the different pieces. It's, uh... What? This is. It's always a dangerous question to ask a publisher this, but you know what? Do you ever get? I'll put it this way. Do you get these moments where you think? Gosh, I would love to read this specific kind of book. I hope somebody sends me this book to publish. Or do, do you ever feel those like longing for a specific longings for a specific type of book or a specific book even you can imagine? You want somebody to write. You know, you're not the one to write it, but you wish like somebody could bring it to your doorstep and you could publish it. Does do you get th those feelings? Sometimes, but uh, more in the nonfiction end of things. And then, uh, if that's the case, I work with our. We have a, a series called Exploded Views, um, yes. edited by Jason McBride. And I'll call Jason and I'll say, we should, we should get somebody to write about this thing. And then oh. we try to find someone who might want to do it. Listeners will have heard about one Exploded Views book, um, Sean McAuliffe's The uh, the Trouble with Brunch, uh, just on, on a previous interview on this show. So, I guess, how does. Through the lens of sort of that book, how is how is that a representative exploded views book? What do you want to do with exploded views? The 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 goal of the series is to create a sort of short books that are short, readable, not too academic, but take the form of what we might call a lyric journalism. Or I hate creative nonfiction because it doesn't really mean anything. <laughs> if your nonfiction isn't creative, what are you doing? Yeah. Um, yeah. But but books that marry some reportage with some synthesis mm. so they're more than just this is the this is how the facts work and and you know bring in some some opinion some something broader to to the perspective so Sean's Sean's book is a great example of of exactly what how we want the series to work Jason and I decided that we would really like to work with Sean because we've worked with him in the past and then we just started we sat down a couple of times with him and had conversations about what he was interested what uh, class is a huge preoccupation with me, so uh, we just we just talked it all through until we arrived at a book that that made us happy, and it's a it's a book that's looking at the way our class structures have changed in North America, and where people like ourselves who are considered the creative class, for lack of a better term, have a kind of precariousness to our employment and. Um, all consumingness to our uh, to our employment that our parents generation would never have 
permitted to to have happen um and and we love it at the same time yeah. because we get to do something that we want to do but it also eats our lives <laughs> and and Sean is a, a notorious brunch hater. Yes. So, uh, he can be notorious as well. <laughs> he is. He's had death threats. That's true. I, he told me about the death threats. I was very impressed. It's like, did you see what else is in the paper? <laughs> <laughs> um, so we talked about brunch as a kind of focal point for, for that conversation, that brunch is this weird thing that in a way reenacts the, the challenges that we have as a, as a creative class mm-hmm. by putting us in sort of awful situations where you, you have to wait in line and, you know, <laughs> crappy foods or yeah, hungover weights to have. You not know? the best use of a day, ultimately. Or, or the best use of 25 bucks, you Yeah, know? that's true. That's fair enough. Now, you've published, of course, that book of his and also his book of psychogeographic walking tours of Toronto, which is like over 350 pages. And I've read both of those preparing for that one, but it also gave me a sense of the range of of Coach House's books, even within one author. I mean, you have this gigantic thing that's very specific, and then a smaller sort of almost argument or tract or something like that. It's, it's, uh, how do you conceive of the range of Coach House's books? Like, what are the extremes that show the variety you've wanted to achieve here? That's an excellent question, and if I had the answer to that, it would make things a lot easier. Uh, I like to be open. I like to allow for possibilities. So, um, try not to narrow things down too much. I love this series because it does allow us to focus in a particular way while still giving us some breadth in terms of subject matter. Uh, you know, our fiction and poetry are pretty focused in terms of their own mandate. And the nonfiction is an ever-changing mandate, really. Uh, to me, I, I, see the, I see the connection between all of our titles, but maybe that's just because... Right, you saw the process. Yeah, I chose or helped choose all of them, so maybe the connection is just me, which is a terrifying thought. <laughs> Somewhat. Uh, well, every publishing house <laughs> needs a driving personality. I mean, you would think you've probably had the same thought about other publishing houses. Like I, for me as a reader, for most of my life, I never really knew or cared who published a book. You know, in teenage years, college years, it just it didn't matter. I was looking for the author or the subject, really, but. I only recently started noticing publishers because it's maybe it's just me maturing as a reader or maybe there's more specialization or more personality behind publishing houses but now I will look at the colophon and see you know what's what else have they got going on I mean is that a function of has a segment of the publishing world always been doing that or is there really more personality in publishing now it's an interesting question because I have always shopped by publisher. Uh, from day, from well, not day one, but you know, you you learned to read, you read a few books, you knew you were going to go after. You knew, like I want more like this. So. I have always read the acknowledgement page. Oh sure, <laughs> and, I can give you some good clues. And when you see the same editor's name show up a few times, uh, you start yeah. to realize that there's that the connection might be the editor, and um, and I started pursuing that. But uh, you know, there's a record store in Toronto called Soundscapes that mm. is shelved by label. Oh really. So it is. It is. I mean, I guess if you want Blue Note, you want Blue Note, and so on and so forth. Yeah, and it, it's a. In fact, one of our Exploded Views books is called Curationism, about mm-hmm. the rise of the curator in the visual arts, but also in the way that we curate everything we do now. Like your playlist, your we're outfit. All, we're all curators. We're all curators. It's a bit. It's a bit tedious, but um, uh, you know, publishers are kind of the ultimate, historically, the ultimate curators in terms of literature and. Um, so I've I've always I've always shopped that way, but I think people are starting to realize that you're getting something. You know, if you buy a Melville House book, that means right. something particular. If you're buying a New Directions book, you know, I love uh, Dorothea Publishing Project, mm. which is very small press. They do two to four titles a year. I buy every season. I just buy all their books. What I do don't. What they put out? It's fiction mostly. Uh, I just I have kind of a standing order with them. Whatever they publish, right. I'm going to buy. What got you hooked? What got you doing that? I liked the first book I read from them, and I liked the sort of energy of the house and the, the you know, I haven't met the people who run it, although I keep trying to. Um, they're just, I'm just really interested in what they're doing as a, as a fellow. I have a publishing crush on them. A publishing crush, you know, I, what's, what, what does it take to, to earn a publishing crush from you? I mean, when you're, even, I don't even mean current houses, it could be past houses, shuttered houses. What, what have you... What do you tend to admire in other publishers? You know, it's there's one, there's the element of do they put out books that, that are suited to your own taste? But what do you, what what do you most think you can learn from when you observe how other publishers have done things? 
Uh, that's a question that I'm continuing to try to answer because I, of course, we're all friends. Um, when I have a publishing crush, it's usually a combination. Ideally, the same thing as a crush on a person, where you you like the things that they do and the, the person that they are. So, um, you know, I, I hopefully will fall in love with their list, but then also, you know, I really admire Melville House for the crazy entrepreneurial, you know, <laughs> um, you know, and and Dennis's. Um, commitment to taking down Amazon at every opportunity. I, I have a tremendous respect for that and I just, I, I admire what they do and how they do it. Is Amazon really an enemy? In some respects. Mm. The problem is that it's only in some respects, right? Yeah, I mean, it's great that they sell books. Uh, I just worry that they want to be the only ones selling books, which is not good for a healthy literary ecosystem. We need diversity. It seems like they're more they're so they're getting so geared toward ebooks that it's I don't know I mean it it's almost like they care less about the or will are starting to care less about the space of physical books and starting to care more about ebooks which makes them maybe slightly there's an argument to be made maybe they'll be less of a problem for people focused on physical books for houses focused on physical books do you think that might be true I don't think anybody's focused on physical books I mean we all have to do both or you can't continue to exist so um, you know the worry is that we can't separate a title. You know, the print book and the ebook are two separate entities, but it's the same editorial costs, the same marketing costs. It's all it's all connected. It's two two prongs on one fork for us for each title. So um, if they, you know, as Amazon continues to force us into, uh, you know, dictating the terms of our business. Mm -hmm the more difficult it will be for us to stay in business, mm. print or e. Right. I, I mean, I can see how that works. There's also the element of never quite knowing what they're up to, right? I mean, it's not that easy to see, see past the surface there. No, and I would have a clearer idea than you, although I'm not privy to the individual negotiations with our distributor, but I am privy to the results, and I'm not allowed, of course, to talk about it. Right. And, um, right. and even yeah. then, there's probably some obscurity there, right? Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. But it's sort of nefarious uh, obscurity. <laughs> of course. These are, these are the way things get nefarious when an organization gets to a certain size. You keep, that to, you keep nefariousness to a minimum when there's four people, right? Things stay pretty clear. I mean, we try. But <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> We're going to get capes. <laughs> <laughs> only, yeah, as you keep it to a sartorial level, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. Now, anybody coming here to visit Coach House will notice that it's a, on sort of an unusually named street. It's BP Nickel Lane, but it's it's BP lowercase Nickel, capital N, named after. Tell me about the literary figure it's named after. Uh, Barry Philip Nickel was an avant-garde poet who lived from 1944 to 1988. He died tragically young. Um, and next Tuesday, September the 29th, 30th, 30th, is his, would have been his 70th birthday. Um, he was a real force of nature in the Canadian literary world and is starting to find some uh, visibility in the, in the American poetry scene as well. But he, he was quite radical in his poetics, um, did, did all kinds of crazy stuff. He drew comics like, that were poems. He, he was, uh, you know, did visual poetry, he did concrete poetry, which you can see an example of in our laneway because it's actually dug into the concrete. Mm -hmm. And uh, he wrote novels. He, he was remarkably prolific and the kind of person that people come to us. We just had a Word on the Street book festival on Sunday. And the number of people who come up to the table and said, I met BP once in oh, right. 1974 and he changed my life. Wow. So he, was he really a, was connected back then. He was so uh, generous and giving and radical, but in a in a kind way. And uh, we he was on the editorial board here for years, and we published a bunch of his books. And so he we consider him our patron saint. Mm. So when you first come in the door, you can see a giant life size cutout of him <laughs> standing there. <laughs> what are, what are some other names like his that come to mind as a really as really strong representations of sort of the the best of the Toronto literary world, as well, in, best as in not not best as in like what are the who are the best writers, but like yeah. best as in who represents the way, the way that the Toronto literary world can be at its best. Well, someone like Michael Andache, who was on the editorial board with Nickel uh, for many years and uh, continues to to sort of be a friend to the press. Um, you know, his first couple of books were printed here. Uh, 
set on that linotype that is sitting right in front our fr- mm, front door. That's the linotype. Yeah. Uh, so it, he definitely is, is kind of of a spirit with, with what has gone on here at the coach house. Um, a lot of people, you know, the, the, the thing that we prefer here at the coach house is not to focus on the, on the celebrity, but on the more general sort of community mindedness of the whole undertaking. Mm. With that in mind, I mean, what's what sort of direction the Toronto literary community could take? Are you more are you most excited about in, in the near future? What do you where do you think when you think about the directions Toronto writing could go? What's what's sort of exciting to you? Like, oh, you know, I think this is this might happen. It's what's fascinating you potentially? You know, what's coming down the pike? As as a reader, what fascinates you here? Um. I hope we keep going and continue to be even ever more adventurous in terms of what we do. There's certainly a school of can lit that uh, tends to the more conservative (laughs) that I'm not especially interested in. Um, And I hope that we'll continue to be more brave in what we do politically and aesthetically. And I hope that... um, I hope that we'll find ways to always be smarter and... and, um, dare I say, more (laughs) viable. (laughs) Everybody Um, wants viability. (laughs) It's interesting to me that in other interviews I've read with you, there's the questions are often about sort of what's Coach House doing to publish women or to publish non-white writers, things like that, which I guess I tie in with with Toronto's much-discussed multiculturalism. I mean, do you think that you want to reflect in any way the, ter- the multiculturalism of Toronto? Is that a priority, to be to be as multicultural as Toronto is? How would a publishing house even do that? I mean, is that on your mind at all? Is this, as Toronto as a multicultural city, is that some sort of force in your decision-making? Absolutely. It's, it's extraordinarily difficult, and I always feel defensive answering the question, <laughs> because we're at the end of a long chain of of events that that have to all go all work in the right way you know we have to get manuscripts that are uh, that are really exceptional before we can publish them and if we have a culture in general that does not deal well with you know Toronto's supposed to be the model for multiculturalism but it's absolutely not in, it's in not practice. really what's 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 the wrench in the gears there well you know there's that's a huge question that I don't know that I can entirely answer. What don't you see? What, what would you expect to see in the multicultural capital that you don't quite see here? Oh, I'd expect to see a publishing list that's, you know, more than 50% not white. I see. But that's not the case because our submissions certainly don't remotely reflect the, hmm. the makeup of the city. I see. That's, do you think that's true everywhere in publishing around Canada, or is, is it... Just is—is is it an artifact of who's sending him to Coach House? I think it's a problem that many of my colleagues have as well. We we have had conversations about it and trying to address how to fix it. You know, when it comes down to encouraging, um, you know, encouraging better creative writing at the high school level and encouraging more reading and um, and writing and prioritizing artistic undertakings at at a university level. So it's you know those things have to happen. There have to be writing groups. There have to be. You know, there have to be ways to develop writers. I mean, we're catching them when they're ready to be published. They need to be caught when they're starting to think about what they're going to do with their lives. It brings to mind the setting we're in. We're right by the University of Toronto campus. I mean, do you think somewhere in there, there's there are the writers I need. There are the writers that can really represent this city. It's like, is there that feeling that they're so close, yet sometimes so far? Yeah, I mean, I feel pretty privileged because we're, you know, we're well-respected, and a lot of the you know, creative writing instructors or, or um, even, gosh, even high school teachers send people to us. Oh, really? Um, you know, uh, we've got a friend who teaches at, at U of T and I've acquired two manuscripts from students of his because oh. he'll call me and say, you gotta, you gotta look at this. You gotta, cause you know, got we have someone some, on the inside. Yeah, we've got so many, so many uh, pop- submissions in the pile that right. a, a little nod is, is helpful. Yeah, know? it's... It's one of those, every publisher that I've talked to has something to say about the sort of slush pile, as they call it, of manuscripts that, that are not solicited that stack up and they say, I know there's something good in there, but it's a needle in a haystack, or not even good, just suitable to what we do. Uh, and I very much sympathize with that sense, like, you really, you want to go through a trusted source, you, like like you say, the, the friend at the University of Toronto, but at the same time, you know, does it nag you that there's probably something I would never find through my sources in that pile, and 
I may never get to it because the pile's so big, you know? We do get through it. We do, do we do it? look at the pile. That's right now, well, it hasn't been a priority. We, um, you know, of the four of us, we've had two staff turnover in the past year, so it's been somewhat chaotic and not as productive as we would have liked. So I'm actually about a year behind oh, slush sick. reading, which is terrible. That's but not bad by publishing standards. I know, but it's appalling. <laughs> I mean, I can, I feel for them, right? Sitting there yeah. waiting. Uh, but we do get back to everybody at some point. Every, every manuscript does get, maybe not a full read, but it gets mm -hmm. at least a, at least a look through. Mm -hmm. Finally, I want to touch back on one thing I asked earlier. We know what is, just based on your own curiosity about Toronto, what is, what's a Toronto book you really want to read, whether it exists or not? You know, what's, what, what would be, you know, I just want to sit down with a book like this about Toronto, and maybe it speaks to whatever your current interests, Toronto-related interests are, but what would be one example, not even the book you want to read, but just like, what's a kind of Toronto book you would want to sit down with? That is a really tough question. Or what's just fascinating you about Toronto itself right now? You can probably infer it from that. Right now, I'm, Toronto has made me tired. tired yes. <laughs> uh, hopefully we'll have a great new mayor. Yes. Seems, seems unlikely. Um, and maybe that'll change the course of, of what's happening and inspire me a little more. Right now, I don't want to read about Toronto. <laughs> right. If you're, you're, done with, you're done with Toronto material. I know that Sean, whom we've mentioned, is working on writing about this current election. But it's one of those things, you know, maybe... Maybe you want to read about this election after the dust is all settled. It's it's uh, here in the midst of it. It's just you're more like the the noise needs to cool down a bit, right? Yeah, I mean, a number of people have pitched us books about Rob Ford and the Rob Ford <laughs> phenomenon, and I just have to say, no, yes, I don't. No I don't want to immerse myself in it. I don't want to. I'm done with that man. Yeah, I, I don't want to give him any more yes. attention. I don't want to, you know. Right. Just make it go away. Yes. So. <laughs> He's, he, he, there's, it seems like Toronto has had a tr tr tradition of uh, those types who they will they will get attention no matter what. So you, there's no reason that uh, they need a little bit more from uh, you, from Coach you House. Need help from Coach House. No. Right. <laughs> and it is here outside the offices and of printing press uh, facilities of Coach House Books. I've been speaking today with Elena Wilcox. She is the editorial director of Coach House Books. Located right here in the on a located here, I was going to say on a beautiful day, but whether it's on a beautiful or a crappy day, it's located right it's by the UT Press. <laughs> it doesn't move here from BP Nickel Lane. Elena, thanks so much. Thank you very much. This has been Notebook on Cities and Culture. I've been Colin Marshall, and you can keep up with the cultural creators, internationalists, and observers of the urban scene on the show at ColinMarshall.org. Thanks. Special thanks to everyone who backed Season 4 on Kickstarter, including Joel Neville Anderson, Daniel Levin Becker, Paige Calvert, Commander Manvark, Jonathan Crow, John Cunningham, David Dawes, James DeVito, Tim Dobbs, Paul Doyle, Jake Elliott, Kevin Emmett, Lawrence English, Jonathan Filbert, Andrew Philippone Jr., Michael Fransky, John French, Themistoclus Eucrucius, Will Graham, Umberto Grant, Samuel Hansen, David Hayes, Jeff Hilmer, Brand, Mark Hines, Andrew Johnstone, Tadius Andre Kadlubowski, Peter Kavanaugh, Ted Kane, Andy Cooney, Evan Landman, Alfred Lee, James Maloney, Sean McDonald, Alberto Bruzos Moro, Jason Miller, Rob Mons, Daniel Murphy, Richard Nash, Aidan Nullman, Patrick O'Flaherty, Danny Olson, Michael O'Regan, Ian Blosker, Christopher Porter, MJ Pritchett, Piers Rippey, Rob Schultz, Todd Shimoda, Cam Smith, Deborah Smith, Adam Sutherland, Maureen Kincaid Speller, Anna Traher, Thomas Interberger, Matt Warren, Nick Weigelt, Dion Wolf, Cynthia Yang, and Wayne Wright.